Hello, I'm Toy Cat, and welcome back to the second channel geography video. This is Elm Street series where I talk about geography and the world and stuff. And today, I wanted to talk about a particularly interesting part of more geopolitics than geography, I guess, because it is the concept of states within countries, or republics, or cantons, basically subdivisions of countries where they kind of have countries within them. My first exposure to this, and maybe yours too, is the United States of America. Literally, it's in the name of the United States that they are made up of states. And when you look at a map, you can see all of the states very clearly with their names, their divisions, all this sort of stuff, or at the very least, their divisions. Basically, the United States is a country which the name relies on states, the very concept relies on states. People will identify as being from their state first in some cases. Basically, the United States is a very interesting country because it raises the idea of states to people from unitary states like myself. Here is a map, by the way, of all of the federations in the world, which are green, versus all the unitary states, which is uh, basically the, the, the simple uh, explanation is that green countries are made up of states where the power comes from those individual states or republics, which give them to the central government, whereas blue is countries which give powers to those central, uh, you know, to those local governments from the central government. So the central government has all the power in blue, whereas the federations give the central government some power. Anyway, the reason I bring that up is because there's a lot of federations around the world, and some of these federations do some very bizarre things with their states. And I wanted to talk about the most bizarre implementation of states within countries in today's video because there's just some really wacky stuff that I've realised as I've been researching the world and going around the world uh, that I wanted to share with you in today's video. So hopefully you all do enjoy it. Let's get straight into mentioning, by the way, the fact that if you look at the e Europe and Africa. There's just like pretty much a sea of blue. There's a tiny splodge of green here and there, but it's just blue or otherwise uh, all over there. So interesting, like kind of continental difference here. But let's talk about. Also, by the way, you will notice how like most of Europe and even most of the EU is blue, and uh, I thought that was interesting because the EU is arguably a federation. But let's get uh, talking straight about you know not the EU because that phrase is just fire in everyone's heart. But let's instead talk about Switzerland, which is notably not in the EU and also notably made up of a bunch of cantons. So if you don't know the Swiss cantons, you can barely see them on a map. Again, unlike the United States, it's not shown quite so well, but the, uh, the Switzerland is actually very, very fervently made up of different cantons. Uh, again, it's got the same kind of system where like people are from their canton first, then from the country, and here are the 26 cantons of Switzerland. So it's simple enough to look up at first, but then you realise like, whoa, well those sizes, they're just very strange. And some of that's to do with the fact that, of course, Switzerland is a very mountainous country, so their land area, it's not just one big flat field, it's very, very far from it. Um, but it also gets weirder when you realise that these 26 cantons of Switzerland, again, look at the size difference there. It's, there's no uniformity to it, there's no anything like that. But then also you realise that there's different languages spoken over in the uh, west of the country, they speak French. In the south of the country they speak uh, Italian. There's a little bit of Romance over here and then the majority speaks uh, Swiss German, which isn't even German, it's like a, a variation of German. Basically there's a big, you know, divergence in language, there's diversion in size, there's divergence in population. So in Zurich there's about 1.5 million people in this canton versus about 15,000 in Appenz or in Holden. Basically my point with all of this is is that there's just diverseness all over the place, but they come together and they make a country. Except the, the country of Switzerland is, in some senses, barely a country. I feel like, you know, they only reluctantly have a capital, as I've gone over before. They only reluctantly have a leader. Um, if you've never seen this before, it's one of the crazier uh, kind of things you can see. Uh, but it, this is, um, this right here, is the leaders of Switzerland. So, as you can see, this is, uh, you know, there, uh, there's eight people, there's seven, you know, but basically, the Swiss, the Swiss people elect a council of leaders, seven separate people, and then one acts as a president internationally, but they don't really have a pre uh, you know president. They have seven presidents. Like what what is going on with that? That's just Switzerland. Look how nice they all look. They're all happy in this one. Not ominous like in the other picture. My point being is that Switzerland in a lot of ways is barely a country because they are you know they're kind of cantons first. They kind of come together to have the defense of having a huge uh, country, and uh, that's something fascinating you might not know. Also, if we look at the map right uh, right here, here are all the flags. In case you're curious, there are flags for the separate places. Uh, of course, Zurich is the one where most of the you know it, it's literally a sixth of the population lives in Zurich, so you can argue like, well, that's all the stuff going down, but Geneva, all the way in the French portion, is a pretty big city. Uh, there is some stuff going down the Italian parts, and other romance isn't quite as important. Basically, there is just, like, everything is going crazy in Switzerland, and that's something fascinating enough by itself, but the thing that makes this really crazy is not just the fact that, like, oh yeah, Switzerland, it's crazy, we could talk about that forever, but instead, it's the fact that Switzerland um, is made up of 26 states, right? I've gone over that before. Cantons is what they're called, but we'll call them states to make things easy. So there's 26 states, and they have a Senate kind of, like, in the United States, or, like, like in uh, Canada too, if I'm not mistaken, uh, like in any other country which is made up of states, where these states come together and they have representatives so that each of the individual places can be represented equally. So they have one of these. However, the interesting thing about them that maybe you're not aware of is the fact that they have 46 seats. And you might be like, 26 cantons, 46 seats. 26 cantons, 
46 seats. So, uh, yeah, you might you might be working in the maths on that one. Like, oh, they just elect one point like nine councillors per uh, seat <laughs> uh, per state. Sorry. And the simple explanation for this one is no, that's not how they actually do it. What they do instead is they elect 20, uh, so there's two um, councillors or two, again, people on this board for every single state in Switzerland. But interestingly enough to me, the crazy thing, in my opinion, is the fact that some of these, uh, you know, cantons of Switzerland count as half cantons. That's right. Uh, unlike in America, where even if you live in a state like with, uh, you know, half a million people, uh, you know, not, not looking at you, Wyoming or anything, or if you live in a state with like, you know, 30 million, you get the same too. Uh, in Switzerland, they're actually half cantons, and there are genuine differences in how these half cantons are counted. Uh, such as on the Council of States, where they both get half, a, sorry, they get one representative or half the normal. That's right. There are some states in Switzerland which are literally worthless than others. Also, when there is a popular referendum, uh, sometimes referendums have to be won by a majority population, as well as a majority of states. And in the, in the majority of states contest, you can actually count half cantons for half. So you can win in, like, I think it's 12 of the 26 um, cantons, but as long as they're all full cantons and the ones you lose are the half cantons, you can still win overall, which is crazy to me, but that's genuinely how they do the whole system. Basically, uh, I guess it would be yeah, it would be 12, right, if you wanted to get it. But my point being with this is it's really, really crazy, silly the way uh, the Switzerland system works, but it's something that makes sense to them. In case you're curious, by the way, why are there half cantons? I'll show you on the map right here. Uh, Apples and Innerhold, uh, you know, I'll show you on the map uh, right here, because I think it looks, um, it looks way more fascinating when you see it on a map. So this right here, the canton with the smallest population. It's a half canton, you might think for population reasons, but it's actually because they split from Appenzoll and Outer Roads, again, it's Swiss names. Uh, basically, the, when the cantons split, they actually only keep half of the, if, if they split and they're kind of the same, so this is like the inner, it's not even a city, but the, you know, this is like the inner area and then the outer area, which by the way, there's like exclaves in these cantons, it's weird stuff. Uh, the, when they split, sometimes they agree to just be half cantons. Uh, the same happened with Basel. Uh, when Basel split into two, Basel became Basel city and then Basel Landschlacht. So there's two separate half cantons. Even though Basel has a much higher population than some non-half cantons, such as Zug for instance. So Zug I really like as a um I really like Zug as a uh, as a place because um, it's one of the smaller states within Switzerland, uh, uh, sorry, smaller cantons. They have a population of about 40,000 people. They're also the smallest by area, if I'm not mistaken. So, fun little fact, the canton of Zug, oh, this is the city of Zug. So, Zug, canton, this is the smallest, uh, you know, <laughs> again, look at, look at the size of it within Switzerland. But, uh, yeah, the fun fact about there is that you can actually pay your taxes using Bitcoin. So, isn't that a crazy fun fact? You can pay your taxes in Bitcoin if you live here, and you'll be one of the 40,000 people who can vote and stuff. Oh, also, fun little fact about the, um, just, just to go back to Appenzell uh, in Holden, uh, they were the last, uh, one of the last places in the world, really, to introduce female voting. Uh, even though women voting was allowed officially in Switzerland, like, many decades before, it was 1990 where they finally allowed women the right to vote. And you might think, like, wow, that oppressive place, like, denying their women the right to vote. But a lot of women didn't want the right to vote. They're like, you know what, my husband makes that decision for me. And I don't know, that just, that just goes to show how old-fashioned a place can be while still living in a very modern country because of how different Switzerland can be. From Zurich, which is such a modern futuristic city, to uh, the place where women don't want the right to vote. You know, I'm just saying, it's fascinating to me, but that moves us nicely into the second example of a federation or a federal state. Uh, again, it's it's arguable where the difference lies, uh, but let's talk about uh, Belgium, because Belgium has uh, three separate main uh, you know, federate, uh, federal parts. There is uh, the north part, which is Flanders. There is the south part, which is Bologna. So, okay, here is Flanders. As you can see, this is a part of Belgium which speaks Dutch. Again, I always think it's fascinating when countries can come together with multiple languages, but it happened right here. Then there is the south uh, language, the Walloon region, or Wallonia. Um, but this is the area right here. Uh, they used to speak Walloon, but then they eventually ended up speaking French. Long story, but they basically speak French, but not quite regular French. Uh, same with uh, the Flanders and the Dutch. It's Dutch, but not quite perfectly Dutch. Um, and then there's also the final city. You might have noticed if you look at Flanders, uh, that it actually has a gap for Brussels because Brussels is a separate capital region. As a fun fact, the reason Brussels is the capital of Europe is partially to do with the fact that Belgium, being one of the first federations in Europe, uh, Brussels has a lot of powers to itself to keep the... Uh, basically, uh, because Belgium's a federation, like the rest of Belgium doesn't put pressure on the EU being there. And it, it kind of works out for everyone one, that Brussels is like this neutral zone in the middle of Europe, and that is why it's the EU capital. So there's another fun fact. But yeah, there's three parts of um, there's three parts of Belgium. That's uh, you know, it's, it's not like a heavily federalized place. Like it's not like oh, 50 states or 26 states uh, like you might expect. But it's actually made up of just three separate parts. There's also a German-speaking community. We won't get into that now, although it's fascinating that there's three languages. Uh, although arguably in you know Brussels they speak English instead to, to some extent. Not always, I know. 
big asterisks and everything. Uh, but let's talk, uh, they speak French a lot too. Again, French kind of wins over Dutch, even though it's in the Dutch part of Belgium. But let's not talk about that. Let's instead talk about the uh, French underside, actually, because, again, interestingly, the Walloon region of Belgium is the less populated part. It's only by, like, you know, a few percent. But it means that whenever a government is formed for the whole country, there's this huge divide between the two parts. They're really, like, aggressive towards each other. And there wasn't a government for, I think it was, like, 16 months that Belgium just didn't have a government because, again, you need both sides to cooperate. And that same both sides being needed to cooperate actually runs into an issue when you get to something like this. So this is uh, Wallonia, uh, this little article, Wallonia adamantly blocking the EU's trade deal with Canada. That's right, the um, the region of Wallonia, this place right here, where three and a half million people live roughly out of the, it's about half a billion people living in the EU. So uh, this tiny region of Belgium, because of the Belgium constitution and the way Belgium laws work, uh, they were blocking a trade deal with Canada. And that is, that's crazy, right? The, the tiny little region of Belgium, because of the way it's a federation and the power comes from the uh, you know the states up to the uh, you know the government uh, meant that this uh, region of Belgium could block a trade deal with the entirety of the you know EU and Canada until they got some concessions to their liking and I know I think that's kind of nuts like all of the other twenty seven countries were on board UK included um, but but you know Wallonia was like nah. Uh, we, we we need some farming concessions or whatever, they're gonna destroy our goods, something like that. And I, I, I think that's crazy, and it's either, you know, like, this is this is where it raises the conversation. Is that a good thing, that there is that much local government, that a huge international treaty that was gonna bring prosperity in some form to all these other places can be blocked by a place like that? Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? I don't know, I guess that's the sort of thing you have to pick for yourself, but I just find it fascinating. But yeah, also there's a German speaking part of it here, with Upen being their rough capital. They have a little parliament where they make laws for themselves, so isn't that cute? And that's within Wallonia too, so I guess it was the French part of Belgium, with a little bit of some Germans. I don't imagine they were going all that, but yeah, some tiny- it, it Also, by the way, to the, the reason this is even crazier is like, so to block the entirety of the EU, you don't even have to just be the like one region, you have to be the majority in that region, which makes you the minority in the country, which makes you the minority in the EU. And I know it, it raises questions. Like it's one of those like big, like I guess political debates where there's no right answer, there's just like debate. And I think it's fascinating and it's something worth considering like if you really love the idea of like down to level local government, that sometimes you get local governments that are just like, yeah, whatever, we, we <laughs> let's not play ball. And that's why stuff gets centralized in a way that some people don't like. But fascinating fact, let's move on to another federation, which is the Russian Federation. So you might not be aware of it, but Russia's full name is actually the Russian Federation. And uh, yeah, it's only been around since 1990, or at least in its current state, when the USSR dissolved. So the USSR was this crazy multi-level federation, uh, was the Union of so Soviet Socialist Republics. So, you know, they're all republics within the same union. It was mostly just like Russia, but Russia and friends. But the crazy thing about the Union of Russia, you know, the USSR, is the fact that there were, you know, countries within it. So there was like, oh yeah, the Ukrainian SSR and the Russian SSR. But then there was also within those countries, such as the Moldovan SSR, there were countries within them. So there was a Transnistrian SSR, which is now a, like its own little country. And then those countries within those countries, within that country, Kind of had their own subdivisions too. So basically, Russia goes crazy, crazy down to the levels. But let's talk about modern, modern day Russia because even modern day post Soviet Union 2017 Russia is a pretty, it's, it's kind of a bull. So let me show you a map of it. This is all of the, so let me zoom this out a little bit for you. This is a map of all of modern day Russia um, on all their Russian states or oblasts as the word they use here. So again, they use uh, they use cantons in Switzerland. They use oblast uh, in the Slavic speaking world for the most part. So in Ukraine, it's still oblasts. And in a lot of countries, it used to be oblasts. It's kind of just a Russian thing, uh, but also Ukrainian and Belarusian. But, but my point being is, uh, yeah, basically they have oblasts, which are the equivalent of states. And you can see them if you look around right here. So there's a lot of things that make these wacky. Uh, the first of all being the fact that if you look on a map right here, this is a map of all of the oblasts. Blast, craze, federal atomic subject, lots of different words in Russia. And you might look at it and say, oh yeah, the reason it's in different colors is like how if you look at a regular map, they have different colors so you can see the countries distinguish where one ends and where one begins. No, that's not the reason for this. Every one of these colors on this map, you know, uh, the, the yellow, the green, the blue, the orange, the purple, <laughs> the red, they all represent a different tier of status within the Russian government. So remember how I was like kind of mind blown that like, oh yeah, Switzerland, they have half cantons, uh, you know, as opposed to like the kind of egalitarian across the board, like a state to state in America. In Russia, it's very, very, very much the opposite. So yellow, I'm going to go for a few of these, not all of these. Yellow represents an oblast. So that's just the generic like state level thing. They have local government, they have stuff like that. A red represents a federal, uh, a city of federal importance. So there's just free of those. Uh, by the way, we're mentioning Crimea here because Russian claims it says. This is like Russian claimed, not internationally verified, blah, blah, blah. But we've got three cities. 
We've got, uh, you know, Moscow. We've got, uh, that was a weird noise. Uh, we've got St. Petersburg. And we've got um, the brand new city they just picked up, Sevastopol. So they're three, three cities of federal importance. They're cities with a lot of powers devolved, like you get in other countries. Then you have uh, the... <laughs> <laughs> the orange ones, which are craze, if I'm not mistaken. They have a lot of similarities to a republic, which is green, uh, but they were once the, like, frontier of Russia, so they had, like, they have retroactive laws and things from back when they used to be the edge of the country. Because, interestingly enough to me, is the fact that Russia used to just be European Russia. Kind of just stopped kind of here, again. It, depending on how far you go back, but then they kind of did the, in the same way America had to expand to the west, Russia expanded to the east, and they just kept on expanding, and they kept on expanding, and uh, interestingly enough, like, even the, the parallel between Russia and America, where they both, you know, Ru the US expanded uh, west, and America, uh, Russia expanded east, and then they, like, kind of meet at that point, it's kind of beautiful if you ask me, but yeah, let's go back to the map, and let's talk about the fact that there's also the one purple place right there, so that purple place, you're not going to believe its name if you've never heard of it, but it's the Jewish Autonomous Oblast, it looks like this on a map right here. So this is it. It has a population of about 160,000 and they have their autonomous oblast status. They're the only one by the look, look, try and find purple on this map. You can't because basically autonomous oblasts used to be a thing in the Soviet Union. Most of them were phased out, but the Jewish autonomous oblast has been kept ever since, even though, so, you know, it's, it's a one-off thing in Russia where they're autonomous entirely, basically. Um, and the crazy thing about it, the, the thing that's like the catch and the, the crazy selling point is the fact that the Jewish autonomous oblast in Russia is not Jewish. Uh, at one point, they wanted it to be Jewish, but it never had a majority Jew population. They just wanted to be like, well, Jews are now officially a thing because they have an heir, and they gave it to them, a very tiny place. It's mostly just farmers, 1% of which actually are Jewish, so <laughs> I guess that counts for something, but 97% count themselves as ethnic Russian. Basically, this is an area where Jews claim to live so that Jews can have some rights, but Jews don't live here because, I mean, you go to Israel or something, right, instead, uh, especially at the end of the Soviet Union. So uh, instead, the Jewish autonomous oblast is just kind of this area of Russia which has this weird special status where there's no particular interest in removing it and which just remains to this day with again a small enough population that it's just not bothering anyone so there's the Jewish autonomous oblast also what we're talking about crazy things uh I, sp I spoke about Yakusha a bit recently but just in case you want to see that again so here's Yakusha this is a republican Russia republics are essentially like they have autonomous constitutions, parliaments, leaders in some cases. Uh, Chechnya is pretty famous for having like a very anti-gay one, right? Like there are no gays in Chechnya. Might have heard that if you follow the world. If you haven't, then guy from one of the republics just claimed there was no gays in this place. But anyway, the reason I bring these up is because they're a never allowed status. And then finally, we have cities of federal importance. So this is quite interesting because uh, the way these uh, federal districts work. So if we go to the city of Mo actually we'll just click on Moscow. Uh, <laughs> if we go to the city of Moscow, as you can see right here, this is the uh, this is the oblast which has all of their thing. But unlike uh, what they do in a lot of other countries, um, where they give like the surrounding area to that oblast or state or whatever to or district, whatever we call it. So Greater London, for instance, uh, you know, like any, any form of metropolitan area belonging to that same place. In Russia, they actually have a Moscow Oblast, which again, kind of fascinating that like the area around it governs itself separately to the way Moscow is done. And then also they have one of these around St. Petersburg. So St. Petersburg, the city exists as St. Petersburg. And then if you go around it, this is the crazy bit. Uh, St. Petersburg used to be called Leningrad and the Oblast around it is still called Leningrad. And it's huge separately. Like, like look at, look at the size of this. But yeah, basically this this is just a bizarre thing to me that like they didn't rename the oblast around it so the surrounding areas of st petersburg are still called leningrad and uh, uh, you know again like given the history of the soviet union of all of this sort of things it's just kind of crazy that they, they they left it that way in in my opinion maybe it's not maybe you're a big lenin fan you're like well there we go, Len bring Lenin back, bring back the Soviet Union, but just wacky enough to me, in my opinion. So, there you go, that is um, the craziest kind of thing. Russia is divided into six separate tiers. You might be like, ah, oh, that's not too many tiers, right? No, that's six, that's red, that's yellow, that's green, that's orange, that's blue, that's purple. That is a lot of separate <laughs> levels and districts, and I didn't even explain all of them properly, but basically that's because they're all very similar. You just get slightly more rights as you go down the like, oh yeah, we enslaved your population, have some more autonomy. Yakusha, for instance, is a republic, has a lot of stuff. Um, the most, or arguably the least, depending on your definition, goes to the autonomous oblast, but that's its own thing. Uh, again, the Jewish area. But basically, Russia is just a complex place, uh, unlike the US, where they have e equal states. They have six level of states in Russia, and uh, you don't hear very much about them, because, again, I guess maybe most of the internet just doesn't care about Russian states. But they are, they are there. There are Russian people. As I've gone over before, there's like very weird ethnic groups in, not weird, but there's very unique ethnic groups in Russia, and that's being made of known. 
Again, the, the Chechnya thing always comes to mind. And uh, basically, let's move on next from this to talk about the final one, which is the Canada. So Canada, uh, a lot of people assume it has states because you look at a map. And you can see, again, unlike most other countries, it's really just like Canada, um, uh, United States, and I think Mexico too, uh, where you can see the states very clearly before you zoom in too far. Like, even on Mexico, it's not true. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's a Google Maps being America-centric. But uh, Canada actually has its state names very clearly enabled on the state. But the fun fact about it is the fact that all uh, all of these things up here, uh, so there's actually, um, there's a word for it, but they have states, essentially. They're not called that. They're called, um, <laughs> I, I actually forgot the exact name of it. But they're the provinces, if they're a, uh, you know, a state essentially, and they're a territory when they're not a state. They look like a state on a map, uh, but the four, the three separate provinces on the top, or the three separate territories, are not actually states. They're controlled by the federal government, and that's because in the entirety of the three top states, Yukon Territory, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut, about 60,000 people live in each one of those. So basically, all three of them combined have less population than a whole state, and it really leads to this weird situation where most of Canada's land area, so I mean, it's not when you look at the Mercator, but looking on the, sorry, when you're looking at a globe, but when you look at the Mercator projection, most of Canada's land is actually in these uninhabited territories. In fact, Canada does just have the states down here. And again, a lot of people perhaps not aware of that one. Also kind of crazy fact, because, you know, that goes to show just how like small Canada actually is. Um, but Canada is even smaller than the top of these states because the top of these states is already so rural. Most of Canada exists so close to the border. Like you get some weird exceptions like Edmonton is all the way up here, but like all the way up here is like still only halfway into Alberta. Basically, all of Canada exists in this one kind of like stretch along the border with America, which, because again, it gets really cold and really untamable and really, basically the terrain doesn't like you when you go too far north. And again, it's a fact a lot of people don't know. And this means that the way to connect Canada, it's only, you know, you might think like really well connected uh, country like America, but no, there is actually only one bridge connecting all of, um, you know, like Canada together. And during uh, one point, because it's called the Trans-Canada Highway, if I'm not mistaken, at one point that Trans-Canada Highway actually was was broken. The trans Canada Highway near Nipibogan reopens to one lane. Uh, but there was a huge bridge, and it's the one bridge connecting the whole country. When that bridge was down, Canada was officially, you know, West Canada and East Canada were officially cut off from each other. And that, in my opinion, is, as you might say, bananas. So there you go. Thank you very much for watching this video. Uh, I want to talk about states a little bit. Um, Canada's system, where they have, like, states and then not really states but we'll pretend they're states we've got um the swiss system where we've got cantons and half cantons we've got belgium where the whole basically the eu is set up there because they have states and one of the states blocked an eu deal so ooh, isn't that crazy and then we have russia where you know what, we can categorize things how we want because we're russia and i just thought that was fascinating and maybe you agreed with me so thank you very much for watching this video i hope you all enjoyed it uh second channel don't care goodbye